Good morning everyone. I am here to discuss about the anesthesia management for posterior cranial fossa surgery. So this is how a patient would typically present with a 42 year old lady with history of headache, vomiting, decreased hearing on the right side for 2 years, detected hypertensive on admission and put on losartan and thiazide. On echocardiography, there were no regional valve motion abnormality and the ejection fraction was around 60% and the ECG was normal. Hemoglobin, electrolytes and glucose were within normal limits. Now let's go back to the anatomy. What is posterior cranial fossa? Posterior cranial fossa, the skull base is divided into three aspects, anterior, middle and the posterior cranial fossa. Superiorly, the boundary is formed by the tentorium cerebelli, inferiorly by the foramen magnum and the occipital bone, lateral by the petrous bone and the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, and anteriorly by the dorsum sella, clivus, and posterior aspect of the sphenoid. Posteriorly, it is formed by the squamous portion of the occipital bone, and it has so many foramina for the exit of the cranial nerves. Now, what are its contents? The parenchyma mainly include the cerebellum, midbrain, pons and medulla. The parenchyma contributes 4% of the total brain mass. It also includes the control center for breathing, cardiovascular system, pain modulation and consciousness. It also includes third and the fourth ventricles and the cisterna magna. Now the artery, it includes the vertebrobasilar system, their branches, most important ones are the posterior cerebral artery, superior cerebellar, anterior inferior and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. Venous system, the deep venous system including the internal cerebral veins, basal vein of Rosenthal, posterior mesencephalic vein, lateral mesencephalic vein and mainly the confluence of sinus which includes the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus. Cranial nose, the Cranial nerves from the 3rd to the 12th arise from the posterior cranial fossa. Now what are the possible lesions in this posterior cranial fossa? It can be either congenital like Arnold Cherry malformation and Andy Walker syndrome or it can be vascular like arteriovenous malformation and aneurysm. Tumors can be intraaxial or extraaxial. Intraaxial include ependymoma, medulloblastoma, astrocytoma and hemangioblastoma. Extra axial include meningioma and schwannoma. The other possibilities are cerebellar infarct and hematoma. So these are all the various lesions. This is the cerebellopontine lesion situated between the pons and the cerebellum. These are the nodular lesion where you can see a cyst with the nodule which is a characteristic of oligodendroglioma seen in the cerebellum. This is an intrinsic lesion seen extending into the upper portion of the cervical spinal cord. These are all the fourth ventricular midline tumors causing obstructive hydrocephalus and this is an intrinsic brainstem lesion. So these are the different possible lesions with which patients would come for surgical procedures. Now how do we assess these patients in the preoperative room? We should go through the presenting symptoms. These presenting symptoms depend on the location, the growth rate and the impact on the CSF flow. Tumors presenting in the midline the patient presents with ataxia and nystagmus. Tumors which are situated laterally into the cerebellum can present with tremors, dysarthria, gaze paresis. Whenever there is a tonsillar herniation due to increased intracranial pressure, patient can present with meningismus, bradycardia, vocal cord palsy and abnormal respiratory pattern. If the brainstem is involved, patients can have pupillary changes, abnormal respiratory pattern, cranial nerve palsies and motor deficits. In the assessment, one should look for signs of raised intracranial pressure like nausea, vomiting, headache, drowsiness and papilledema. Any history of CSF diversion procedures like ventricular peritoneal shunt. Signs of lower cranial node dysfunctions like regurgitation, swallowing difficulty, choking sensation, voice change. Hydration status because if these patients have repeated episodes of nausea and vomiting or if they have any swallowing difficulty, they can present with dehydration, neck stiffness and respiratory pattern. All these will tell us whether this patient requires prolonged ICU care, 
ventilation or retaining the endotracheal tube. Cardiac evaluation is a must if you are planning for sitting position. And elderly patient with uncontrolled hypotension, they can present with hypotension during induction position. So in these patients, cardiac evaluation is must. Neck movements is essential where do for laryngoscopy, surgical sitting position. One must ask for shooting pain whenever the neck is flushed. That will tell us the range of neck movements which can be acceptable during laryngoscopy, intubation and even during surgical positioning. Investigations would include hemogram, grouping, cross-matching, renal function test, glucose, especially if these patients are on steroids, electrolytes if they give repeated history of vomiting, X-ray chest, if the patients have lower cranial opacity, they could have got regurgitations and the infection. Ultrasound of the lungs and the heart and ECG. Imaging studies are required to diagnose or localize lesions. Cervical spine X-ray is required maybe for the elderly position to decide on the head position. Pre-medication, 